A hundred years ago, the futurist H.G. Wells said that we're in a race between education and catastrophe. He could well have foreseen our current destruction of the biosphere. We're unraveling the weave of the web of life itself, though we barely understand it, or perhaps because we barely understand it. Is our ecological crisis primarily a crisis of education? If so, we could be in luck, because the answers to how to sustain human communities are embedded in the four-billion-year-old school of natural history of life on Earth. The facts of life are all around us, if only we pay attention. David Orr says that the first step in this enterprise is to become ecologically literate. After all, the Greek word from which ecology comes, oikos, means household. Ecological literacy is the study of the Earth household. As the author and physicist Fr Fritjof Capra adds, in this century, ecological literacy will be a critical skill for politicians, business leaders, and professionals in all spheres. It will be the most important part of education at all levels. David suggests that all education is environmental education by virtue of what we include or exclude about how people are part of the natural world. Curriculum is any place that learning happens. And what all education is finally about is how we are to live in this interdependent world. David knows that the most important thing we can teach our children is what Rachel Carson called a sense of wonder. He believes that our capacity to experience that wondrous feeling of being part of the creation of all life requires childhood experience in nature, early validation by adults, and constant practice. Falling in love with nature may just, just be our best hope for the future, especially for the children who are the future. Though he's far too, too modest to admit it, David is the most important innovator in environmental education in the country, and probably in the world, and he's one of the great visionary educators of all time. He's been instrumental in putting the concept of eco-literacy on the map and stimulating many, many educational institutions to probe the terrain. He's the rare educator who translates big ideas into practical actions. His influence extends far beyond education into the field of ecological design. David's a professor at Oberlin College and the chair of the environmental studies program there. With his leadership, Oberlin's environmental studies program has provided a cutting edge model of truly holistic interdisciplinary approach to the study of human interactions with the environment. He was the central force in the creation, design, and building of the Adam Joseph Lewis Center at Oberlin, a $7.2 million uh, environmentally intelligent environmental studies center. The New York Times called it the most remarkable of a new generation of college buildings. The US Department of Energy honored it as one of 30 milestone buildings of the 20th century. David's been a board member of the Center for Eco-Literacy since its founding a decade ago. He coined the term ecological literacy, and his book, his landmark book of the same name, ha has been the, the uh, milestone in that field. Um, he has been a leader in place-based education, a core principle of the Center for Eco-Literacy. He also contributed the foreword and two chapters to the new Bioneers book, Ecological Literacy, which I hope you all take a look at, Educating Our Children for a Sustainable World, a truly remarkable collection of material. He's the author of several other classic works and has written over 120 articles in scientific and professional journey, journals, including conservation biology, one of the most important in the field. David comes from a long line of preachers. In fact, his paternal grandfather christened the young Rachel uh, Carson at her baptism. Her, yeah, her work would later awaken him as a young man fresh out of high school. David believes that we're in the middle of a worldwide ecological enlightenment. If that is true, it will have been in no small measure because of his mighty efforts. David is preaching the gospel of eco-literacy, equipping the young with the eyes, hands, hearts, and minds to heal the earth and ourselves. Please join me in welcoming the wondrous David Orr. Thank you, they like you. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm preaching the gospel and this is Sunday morning, we're going to have an altar call or we're at least take up an offering. <laughs> no, you can't come to Bioneers um, without sensing that what Kenny and Nina have done for these 16 years is to draw together a movement that includes all of you and lots of people out there. It's a bigger movement. It's a deeper movement. It's a wider movement than any one of us can know. And it stretches back, uh, way back in time, and as far into the future as anyone can possibly imagine. This, and all of you are part of it, is the real pro-life movement. <laughs> you know, uh, I think education is a bigger subject than we think of typically. Education gets confused often as something that happens in schools, and schools is probably where it happens worst. And I want to describe to you what I think is perhaps a teachable moment in American culture. Well, I want to begin with Katrina and Rita. Uh, sounds like two ladies of the night, but you know what I mean. <laughs> this may be a teachable moment for all of us in America, and maybe for the world. And I want to describe that uh, this morning to you with some pictures. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because um, time may be a little short. I'm one of two people that stands between you and lunch, and that's not a good place for me to be. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Let me begin with, this is an article taken from Mark Fischetti's uh, piece in uh, Scientific American. Four years ago, Mark Fischetti, in October of 2001, described a class four or class five hurricane that would strike New Orleans. And you can see here on the red, if my pointer can reach this, can you see that? The escape routes were, were fairly circumscribed, and this is what it would look like had New Orleans been hit with a class uh, four or class five event. The city essentially would have been swept away. What actually did happen wasn't quite what Fischetti and others had feared would happen. A class five event direct head on to uh, New Orleans or Miami or any other city that uh, is low lying, but it was bad enough. And by the time that uh, the hurricane actually hit, it was not class five, it was of course class four. Now I want to describe some lessons from Katrina, and there are lots. This is kind of like notes for a seminar. There are are lots of things to be learned from Katrina, but I want to describe what I think are four lessons that we could begin with. One is what Gregory Bateson once called the pattern that connects. And for uh, members of the White House, it is simply that uh, what you do has consequences. <laughs> this is what Katrina looked like uh, to NASA imagery as it crossed the Florida uh, peninsula. And Katrina was, as you recall, a class one event when it crossed the, the peninsula. And then it picked up warmth. All this water right here was about two degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it was the year before, we're told. And so Katrina picked up the energy from warmer water, and by the time it barreled into the coast, of course, it was, it was a bad uh, storm. Between 1985 and 1994, these are hurricane storm tracks. And you can see here the, the image is taken from National Geographic. This was cooler water, but by the time you get to uh, the past 10 years, the water was warmer, the storms were bigger. And so all the, the band of, uh, that, that you see here, the width of the band relates to the size and severity of the storm. And that is as it is predicted. This is a, the cover from an article by Carrie Emanuel that appeared in Nature magazine, which is the, the British counterpart to science in our country. And Carrie Emanuel uh, says that we are, because of warmer seawater related to global warming, we'll face uh, more storms, more severe storms, bigger storms, more destructive storms. This is an article that appeared in Science magazine uh, about a month ago uh, to the same effect. We know this now. So the issue here is, what will global warming do to storms? And uh, the, the story here is not particularly happy. This is a record done by IPCC of temperature, and you were right about here. But in the course of the 21st century, what IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, projects is a warming between 2.5 degrees Fahrenheit and about 10.4 degrees Fahrenheit. 
And there is recent evidence that that may be only half the story. They may have gotten it half wrong. It could be twice as bad. This is a, uh, some prose taken from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report. And this document, when this document appeared, this was page eight, if I recall correctly, in the New York Times. Guess what was on page one? Terry Schiavo. So the fact that the planet, and this is the largest assessment ever done of uh, the uh, ecological health of the planet, the fact that the planet is dying uh, rather rapidly was page eight and a small column, Terry Schiavo is page one. But what this suggests is the increased likelihood of nonlinear changes, and that means two plus two all of a sudden doesn't equal four anymore, it equals five or six or 22. James Lovelock, uh, the author of the Gaia hypothesis years ago, said this recently. Sometime during this century, the Earth system will pass a threshold beyond which it is committed to irreversible and mostly adverse change. Once we pass this threshold, set by the level of carbon dioxide in the air, somewhere between 400 and 500 parts per million. And then he goes on to say, all hell will break loose. Now, we're at 380 parts per million CO2 and another undetermined amount of, uh, in carbon dioxide equivalent units, uh, maybe 30 or 40, uh, CO2 equivalent units, we're adding to that uh, about two and a half parts per million per year. This is a record of um, temperature anomalies, and the darker the red, the darker or the more severe anomaly, this is the uh, metric right here, and you can see uh, the northern hemisphere got hit and the trend line here below that. So what appears to be happening is, is happening fairly rapidly. Now, we call this global warming, and all of you know this is not just global warming, this is planetary destabilization, and it looks like this. Rising sea levels, storms and storm severity, changing diseases, drought and heat waves more severe, changing ecosystems, coral bleaching, marine ecosystems under great stress, political and economic disorder. The World Health Organization now uh, says that we've, we're losing about 150,000 people per year because of climate-driven weather events. Now. Uh, this first lesson is connect the dots, and this is connect the dots time. Our fuel efficiency as a nation is where it was in 1980, or just a little bit below, about 22 miles per gallon per vehicle. Does that connect to uh, our interest in Saudi Arabia and, and Iraq? I mean, if Iraq's major uh, export was rutabagas, uh, would we be there? Um, <laughs> And then there's this issue of peak oil. Uh, we've, uh, uh, U.S. Uh, oil peaked, uh, production, or pardon me, extraction peaked in 1970, uh, uh, as M. King Hubbard said it would. Applied to the world now, there's a debate about peak oil worldwide, and the, the evidence varies a little bit. Kenneth DeFaze, who is a, a petroleum geologist at Princeton, believes that the peak of world oil, not production now, but extraction, will occur uh, this year on Thanksgiving Day at about 4 o'clock. Uh, <laughs> But whatever it is, most of you in the room will live during the peak year, which we will see only in hindsight. We will not see this uh, necessarily as it happens. Is world oil production or extraction connected to terrorism? Is it connected to the wars that we have to fight? And by the way, the Pentagon now calls these transfer tubes. They are no longer referred to as caskets. And now to the storms, Katrina. Is there a connection here? Well, only the blind or the willfully blind can't see it. Now, American public says that we want an energy policy that favors efficiency in renewables, but this is the current research uh, budget in the current energy bill that just passed, heavy on nuclear, heavy on coal. The, um, that's not what we've said we want. Here's lesson one, things are connected. Environment isn't just another item on the list. It is, in fact, the linchpin that connects everything else on the list. We're not just another item somewhere that we'll take care of at some point. In the rebuilding of uh, the Gulf Coast, it's now being said by lots of people of the right-wing persuasion that we have to amend or simply suspend all environmental regulations so that we can get our economy back on track. That's exactly the wrong thing to do. Get the environment wrong, and sooner or later, you'll get everything else wrong. Equity, economy, security, everything else. 
Is there a better energy policy waiting? On the left-hand side, the Rocky Mountain Institute has put out a document called Winning the Oil Endgame, and even Fortune magazine got into the debate a year or so back. We know how to get off oil. This is not a technical issue. It's a political issue. We know that windmills, solar power, efficiency are labor-intensive. It puts Americans back to work. This is a, the data on the top here is from the Apollo Alliance, and the Apollo Alliance projects that we could add 3.3 million jobs just by getting to 20 percent renewables. This is photo a photovoltaic array on the Adam Joseph Lewis Center that uh, Kenny mentioned. And we know that the cost or price of PV-generated electricity has been dropping dramatically. Production is rising, but the United States now produces less than a third of the PV material than Japan. We've lost the market, a market that we originally developed. Here's the second lesson. I think Katrina exposes that we need a larger dialogue about the land. Uh, we uh, inhabited this uh, land that the Native Americans called Turtle Island, but we are only beginning to discover it. And what's it look like? Well, this is the mouth of the Mississippi River. And down here on the right-hand side, you can see the what is happening to the delta. It's happening for lots of reasons, uh, oil extraction, economic development in, in the area, to the point where in the Times projection, uh, this lower panel right here, the delta is virtually gone. It is virtually submerged by the year 2090. We know that the area is sinking at the rate of about five feet per century. This is, and this may be hard to see, but everything in orange is an oil platform. Everything in gray is an oil well. And then you see the connective tissue, all the pipelines between this. This is the fossil fuel area. We've made this part of the United States an energy sacrifice area. Everything in red here has already been flooded all the way up to New Orleans, but this is the coast of New Orleans. And uh, if you extend a little bit further to the west, it's the same story. Everything here is sinking or underwater. This is what it looks like. Uh, dying cypress swamps, houses already taken, and this is a pre-Katrina and pre-Rita photograph. This process has been underway for a long time. But it isn't just oil. It's that we've made this area a national sacrifice area. This is one of the major dead zones uh, around the earth, and this is uh, one of 50. This is an area that is essentially anoxic, a dead zone, that used to be 50% of the U.S. commercial fisheries. It's an area now the size of the state of New Jersey. It expands a little bit every year. We'll wait to see what it, uh, it looks like after uh, Katrina and the devastation in New Orleans. Now, this is U.S. land policy. It is a kind of a de facto policy. This area, we've made a large protein factory. My part of the world, we grow soybeans. Uh, in corn, and then we ship that uh, down the, the excess nitrogen uh, that, that is fed or put into fields. Uh, we over fertilize nitrogen by about uh, 100 percent, uh, double the, the amount that it's needed, uh, creating the dead zone. And then a slaughterhouse, all the uh, confinement feeding operations where we ship the protein to. And then we've got these animal gulags located in places like Iowa and North Carolina. And then we draw down the Ogallala Aquifer. New Orleans and the Gulf Coast take the brunt of this land use policy. But it isn't all. This is West Virginia. This is what's called mountaintop removal in West Virginia. To get at uh, coal, we simply, uh, coal companies now, simply cut the tops off the mountains, dump the debris that they call overburden, interesting word, into the valleys. And for this, they have to have a valley fill permit and a mountaintop removal permit, which they uh, uh, get from the Office of Surface Mining and the uh, Corps of Engineers. And this is what it looks like. One million acres is now gone. This took place roughly in the past 10 years with another million acres scheduled to be removed in the, uh, the next uh, five years. The last time we debated as a nation a national land use policy was 1973. And in 1973, this was tossed out. This particular, this is the cover sheet for the, the bill. Uh, this was introduced by Henry Jackson. All it did was to provide planning assistance for uh, states that wanted to engage in uh, land use planning. It didn't require it, and it was dismissed as communistic. When we get around to it, when we get around to it, we'll learn that a land ethic, this idea of a land use policy to inhabit this area, Turtle Island, once again and do it right this time, will mean that we go from being a conqueror of the land community to being a plain member and citizen of it. There's a third lesson. 
ecological design ought to be seen here as a healing art. Imagine a group of designers like Janine Benyus and John and Nancy Todd and many of you in this room being called to help rebuild the Gulf Coast and this time do it right. And design, as all of you know, means how do we make things that fit? And so this is Janine's work and you heard from Janine on, on Friday. And this is John Todd's work and John, uh, an artist with a sixth sense for the creation, the idea of taking uh, instructions again from nature on how we treat water. And this is Wes Jackson, who's been trying to understand how we farm in the way that ecosystems build prairies. I'm not going to tell you what Wes was pointing to here, but that, that's another matter. And then this is Ray Anderson's uh, company interface. Ten years ago, Ray Anderson read Paul Hawkins' book, Ecology of Commerce and decided, he took it, as he said, like a spear in a chest and began to make a company that was a very different kind of company, still pros prosperous and profitable, but one that has now reduced its greenhouse gases by 54%, eliminated 40% of its smokestacks, eliminated 53% of its affluent pipes, 80% of its scrap to landfill, eliminated 28% of its total energy while doubling productivity, eliminated 37% of the BTUs per thousand square yards of carpet, and the blue bars here indicate the savings that the company's achieved by doing it the right way. Can we design corporations and businesses that work right? I think we can. This is the Adam Joseph Lewis Center that Kenny uh, mentioned. We decided, even in cloudy Ohio, to build a building that is powered by sunlight. Next year, this building will be powered entirely by uh, current sunlight, not ancient sunlight stored as fossil fuels, while emitting no waste product. It's drinking water in, drinking water out. Here's a fourth lesson. Imagine if we decided, as a nation, to rebuild the Gulf area, not for casinos, and not for the oil industry, but for children, to help rediscover the magic of childhood. Childhood around the world is in bad shape. Here's a composite of some pictures. The one in the upper right-hand corner that you've seen, we label collateral damage to the bombs that we drop in Iraq. The United Nations estimates that about a quarter of a billion children live without a childhood. One quarter of a billion. They work effectively as slaves for multinational corporations. Could we do it better? I think we could. This is a chart taken from Newsweek magazine, and the, the two arrows down here you see, this is an area where childhood poverty is extreme, and all the disadvantages that go with it. Could we do better than that? I think we could. But instead, there is a consistent effort to try to militarize our young people, introduce them to the weapons of war, these children are below draft age, but if uh, there aren't more volunteers to come, they may take children. I don't know. Richard Liu's book, Last Child in the Woods, pointed in a very different direction. How about a policy to rebuild that area? It makes uh, that Gulf Coast safe and secure for all children, for all time. Let's get kids back in the woods. Let's make safe places for them. You know... I had to figure out some way to get my grandson and granddaughter's pictures in, in this. <laughs> and I don't know she, who she is, but she, isn't she a sweetie? Uh, and she's having a good time. Imagine that the design template for the Gulf Coast would be done around children. Not casinos, not oil industry, not first and foremost economics, but children. Now, the fifth revolution is the thing that brings all this together. And this is where it gets kind of serious. We need to reestablish a government of the people and by the people and for the people. <laughs> this is the famous red-blue map. We've seen it after the election of 2000 and now after the election of 2004. And we're told that we're divided between liberals, or as Rush Limbaugh puts it, liberals, and conservatives. I don't believe that. I think we, in fact, are more like this. If you look at anybody, some of you are going to be conservative on some issues, liberal on others, out in left field on others, confused on still others. It's called the thinking person. We aren't just liberal. We aren't just conservative. We're not just independent. We're a mixture of all of these things.
And you can be a good liberal, and that is a noble word lest we had forgotten. You can be a good liberal and be concerned about the long-term future, the future of the world that your children will inherit and your grandchildren. Or you can be a good conservative, and get, but you have to be a true conservative, and you have to be a good liberal. Point number one is let's take back the discussion about the topography of American politics. We aren't left, we're not right, we're not all conservative or all liberal. Let's talk again as if those are flip sides of the same coin. Words that are, ne or positions that are necessary to each other. Here's the second idea. Let's reclaim our public language. Imagine after 9-11, uh, we were asked uh, in the name of uh, the United States to go shop and then snoop on our neighbors, but not to sacrifice. Imagine a different way to see patriotism that said we sacrifice, but we also defend the land that is America, that that's part of the word patriotism. And imagine conservatism being about conserving something other than the rules of the game by which a few are enriched. And imagine, as Tom Hartman said yesterday, not being just consumers, but in fact being citizens. And imagine government that works for us, a government of the people, by the people, for the people, not for corporations, first and foremost. And imagine rights going with responsibilities. And imagine taxes fairly assessed and well used. George Orwell had it right. War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. Double think means the power of holding two contradictory beliefs in one's mind simultaneously accepting both of them. We live in a world that George Orwell described better than anybody. The art of spin. And language, well, this is Frank Luntz, a uh, Republican pollster. And the, mark, the area marked here in red, the scientific debate is closing against us. He's talking about climate change. But not yet closed. There's still a window of opportunity to challenge the science. <laughs> now, how, when climate change hits full bore, how will your children or your grandchildren regard those words? And then number three, there is this First Amendment. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. And the press is one of two institutions mentioned in the U.S. Constitution. The other is the church. And why was this? Well, James Madison said, put it this way, a popular government without information or the means to acquire it is either prologue to a farce or a tragedy or perhaps both. And you recognize that in our particular time. Freedom of the press, when Ben Bedikian wrote his uh, classic media monopoly, there were still 50 major media outlets. Now we're down to six, one of which is Fox News, an oxymoron. <laughs> one is Disney, one is Viacom, one is Bertelsmann, and then Fair and Balanced News. Well, in 1987, the fairness doctrine was tossed out, and the fairness doctrine meant that you had to treat uh, news and public issues fairly or else you would uh, be in jeopardy of losing your license as either a television station or a radio station. That's been tossed out. Telecommunications Act of 1996 allowed for all kind of concentration across media types. So the news that we get is increasingly infotainment. Uh, geared down to the lowest common denominator, it comes to us as a kind of entertainment, a race to the bottom, and you wonder why Americans are the most media-saturated but the least well-informed people in the modern world. And then there is this problem, and this doesn't come up to the, the current because these, these numbers have accelerated now, but if you're in the bottom 90%, which is most everybody in the room here, I presume, you actually lost in constant dollars real income in the 30 years from 1970 to uh, the year 2000. That, of course, has accelerated in the past because median income has now gone down in this country in each of the past four years. And then if you're in the top category, you've done rather well. And so we didn't have money. We did not have money to put to build the defenses of New Orleans. Uh, all of those uh, levies, we, we couldn't afford that because we're doing other kinds of things. I'm not going to show you this slide because I don't want to pick on anybody's mama. <laughs> but the attitude is telling, isn't it? The attitude is telling that poor people, in fact, can be dealt with in one way and everybody else dealt with in another way. And then if you ask, given the tax cuts, 
what's happened to the federal budget, why could we not afford to rebuild those levies or build them right in the first place? Well, the tax cuts that uh, you've heard so much about, this is the, the biggest part of the uh, overall federal deficit now. Remember, in five years, we've gone from a surplus now to a deficit. This is the other part of it. The Pentagon budget is now $447 billion, with Iraq taking about $200 billion of that. And then there's finally, there's the fifth, there's the systematic denigration of government. This is uh, uh, Tom DeLay, who's recently been uh, in the news. And then this is Grover Norquist. And then, uh, Kenny's quote from Grover Norquist is here. I don't want to abolish government, Grover says. I simply want to reduce it to the size where I can drag it into the bathroom and drown it in the bathtub. <laughs> well, try that on her after Katrina, when FEMA wasn't there. And it's too late to try it on him because he's gone. He drowned. Government wasn't there for these people. It won't be there for lots of other people because we've taken the parts of government that serve people, and we've cut it. But we've made a very, very big military and very, very big security services. Here's a sixth idea. No comment. <laughs> you know, at our best, I'm going to close with a couple of uh, other points here. At our best, Americans have always been a pragmatic people. We're problem solvers. At our worst, we're ideologues. When Thomas Jefferson penned those words of the Declaration of Independence in 1776, the Enlightenment came to bear on U.S. experience in a way that it hadn't been before. All men are created equal. In a time we understood that it was all humans, all people, all persons are created equal. But that was the start of something. I think Jefferson didn't fully realize as a slave owner what he had started. But we now know that equality is at the core of this country. The Constitution of 1787, the attempt to give that idea governing form, and the founders created a limited government, one that had checks and balances so that it could be appropriately uh, held to account for what it did and how it worked. And then Abraham Lincoln, the Gettysburg Address, tried to describe how we would go from being a country, mostly of different states, to one and a single nation, dedicated to the idea of liberty and justice for all. And Franklin Roosevelt's Four Freedoms of 1944, we've come, we came close to achieving the world that Franklin Roosevelt described. But as a world not just of negative freedom, but of positive freedoms, where we would not just stop people from doing things, but we would start all kinds of other things. The lessons from Katrina are these. Things are connected, and they have consequences. What goes round comes round. Violence in all of its forms, violence against nature, violence against other nations, is always self-defeating, will always be wrong. The long term, just isn't that far off. For those children, it appear to be so for those children will live their lives in very quick in the next few decades. The long term is in many ways right here, right now. And the last lesson of Katrina is this. These words health, whole, healing, and holy, they're one and indivisible. That is the power of life. That is this pro movement. That's you and that's me and that's generations yet to come. Thank you. <laughs>